this is Adam Eason. I seem to spend a lot of my time educating clients and members of the public about what hypnosis actually is and steering them away from popular myths and misconceptions about it. So what actually is hypnosis? The founder of Modern Hypnotist, James Braid, formulated his approach based upon the Victorian philosophical psychology known as Scottish common sense realism. Hypnotism was discovered by Braid in 1841 and entailed a more common sense psychological approach to the apparent effects of mesmerism, which was the historical precursor to modern hypnosis. Braid defined hypnotism as focused attention upon an expectant, dominant idea or image. Later, Hippolyte Bernheim, a very important figure in the history of hypnotism, said that there was no such thing as hypnosis other than heightened suggestibility, and named his approach Suggestive Therapeutics back in 1887. Now, before I explain anything further, I need to explain that Hypnotism is essentially the art and science of suggestion, and not that of inducing trances or altered states of consciousness. If you are hoping for an informational guide about altered states of consciousness, and or how hypnosis is about creating a special trance state, then I realise I may have disappointed you. The truth is though, hypnosis is not about trance or altered states of consciousness. Much of what we know about the subject was first expressed in the original writings of Braid, who coined the term hypnotism. He developed his theory and practice of hypnotism through constant experimentation and by carrying out public demonstrations in front of some of the leading scientists and academics of his day. Psychologists up to the present day have continued to carry out important research on hypnosis and its clinical applications. A 1941 paper written by the personality theorist Robert White entitled A Preface to the Theory of Hypnotism is considered by many to be the beginning of the cognitive behavioural approach to hypnosis. Research cited by White in this seminal article suggests that responses to hypnosis are primarily as a result of the conscious attitudes and voluntary efforts of the individual. As a result, he redefined hypnosis as follows. Hypnotic behaviour is meaningful, goal-directed striving, its most general goal being to behave like a hypnotised person as this is continuously defined by the operator and understood by the client. White took the perspective that hypnosis is actually a verb rather than a noun, that is, it is a skill that the individual does, and it's not a passive state that seems to automatically happen in a mechanical fashion in response to something a hypnotist does. White supported the notion, though it was not the first time this notion was supported, that all hypnosis is, to some extent, self-hypnosis, or a process of hypnotising oneself. This started a range of studies and research papers to subsequently develop what is known as a non-state theory of hypnosis. Non-state proponents base their understanding of hypnosis on ordinary psychological processes rather than the hypothetical shrouded in mystique notion of a special hypnotic trance. This also enabled hypnosis to study and be integrated into the wider field of general psychology. Let me explain the non-state stance in a nutshell. The non-state theory of hypnosis emphasises the similarities between hypnosis and everything else. And basically, that's it. Non-state theorists apply healthy scepticism when explaining hypnosis. They look at it in rational terms and with Braid's original approach of Scottish common sense. The approach to hypnosis adopted by myself and by my hypnosis college abandons and rejects the notion of a special hypnotic trance, which is often referred to as a unique and abnormal state, which is so often and quite popularly the explanation for what hypnosis is. In contrast to that way of explaining hypnosis, based on extensive scientific research, 
We explain hypnosis in terms of a hypnotic mindset comprising of ordinary processes such as our beliefs, our imagination, our expectations, our attitude towards hypnosis, our level of motivation, the depth of our engagement with the role of being hypnotized and some other factors we'll examine too. So throughout my own hypnosis trainings, therapy sessions with clients, books and audio programs, when I refer to hypnosis, what I'm referring to is a set of behaviours, attitudes and expectancies that contribute to the hypnotic responsiveness and hypnotic responses, and not an altered state of consciousness or hypnotic trance, as is popularly referred to. If we are going by this premise, how are we going to explain all those people who report a wide and varied array of subjective feelings during hypnosis? I have people from all over the world advise me of all manner of unusual responses that they attribute to my hypnosis audio recordings bought from my website. Firstly, I explain to them that in studies, control group subjects who are simply asked to sit with their eyes shut for a similar period of time without being hypnotized also tend to report unusual feelings. Despite the rejection of the theory that hypnosis is a trance state, non-state proponents do still accept that many people report that they feel they were in a trance. Upon further examination, and despite people reporting similarities, these sensations are not uniform across everyone, and neither are they at all necessary for effective hypnosis. It would be better to understand these responses as side effects of suggestion rather than evidence of experiencing a so-called hypnotic trance. More often than not, these reported responses are simply the effect of sitting still with the eyes closed for a prolonged period, or they are just the ordinary effects of relaxation or mental imagery. My experience has been that many people expect to be spaced out, for example, and they consider that to be evidence of hypnotic trance. This is misleading. That kind of experience is typically a result of responding to suggestion rather than evidence of a special altered state of consciousness. According to the approach that we advocate here, the hypnotized individual does not respond mechanically to the suggestions, but instead in an active and goal-directed manner. Throughout the hypnosis sessions I conduct with clients and throughout my audio programs, it is explained that it is important to adopt a hypnotic mindset. This simply means that you be motivated to be hypnotized, you be confident in your ability to respond, optimistic about the hypnosis process, and that you expect to automatically experience the responses being suggested or imagined. If you adopt this mindset, you will respond better to all of the skills you learn throughout a hypnosis session. To explain this more explicitly, the hypnotic cognitive set that was originally described by Barber in the 1970s and more recently by Donald Robertson in 2012, goes on to formulate a set of five key attitudes that form and formulate the hypnotic mindset. Firstly is the attitude of recognition. When you sit or lie down and get ready to use hypnosis audio tracks, or if you're being hypnotized by a professional, you'll simply recognize the start as your trigger to initiate this progressive, favorable hypnotic mindset. You do so by actively engaging your imagination to the best of your ability, and in a way that you find convincing. You also respond to the hypnotic suggestions with a depth of focus and absorption, so as to avoid distraction during the hypnosis sessions. Secondly, is the attitude of attribution. This is whereby you accurately attribute your responses within and throughout hypnosis sessions to your own imagination your own responses to the suggestions, and your own expectations. That is, you do not permit yourself to think of your responses as just compliance, or an unconscious mind, so-called, doing it for you. You are actively responding, and you are actively responsible for the hypnotic response that you get. So engage your imagination as vividly as possible, expect success, and relax throughout. Thirdly, you adopt the attitude of appraisal. 
This is whereby you appraise the demands of your desired outcome in a favourable way. You realise and appraise hypnosis to be a safe, ordinary process that requires a progressive mindset to develop as a valuable skill. Fourth, we have the attitude of control. It is important that you realise that you are in control of your own hypnosis experience. It is a skill to develop and therefore you assure yourself of your ability to do hypnosis and engage in it in the ways laid out in an audio programme or by a therapist or a hypnosis professional. Continue to encourage yourself and take control of your attitude towards hypnosis. Consider yourself capable. Additionally, be in control of your own level of expectation. Expect the responses that you wish to occur, to actually occur. Expect them to happen automatically. Expect yourself to respond in the ways that you suggest or imagine in your hypnosis sessions. And then the fifth and final attitude to adopt within the hypnotic mindset is that of commitment. It's important that you allow yourself enough time to respond hypnotically to your own suggestions or to the suggestions of a professional. You do not want to rush yourself and likewise you do not want to procrastinate or linger on things for too long. Additionally though, being committed means you invest the right amount of time and enthusiasm into practicing hypnosis skills that follow on from any hypnosis session that you've had with a professional or just to practice your self-hypnosis skills in and of themselves. This hypnotic mindset may seem like a sobering far cry from the magical mystical way in which hypnosis is often presented. However, with this hypnotic mindset, hypnosis becomes demystified and it becomes a skill that anybody can learn and evidence suggests that as you practice this skill you can become more responsive, more hypnotizable and better at using hypnosis. Anyone can do this by applying these simple steps and stages of adopting a hypnotic mindset. If you truly engage in these attitudes and this hypnotic mindset, then the outcomes of the hypnosis sessions that you engage in are going to provide you with far more benefit. It's going to be far more efficacious for you simply by adopting this mindset. We now conclude that hypnotism is basically about inducing a set of attitudes or mindset. You adopt a favourable attitude to get into the right mindset prior to listening to hypnosis audio tracts or having hypnotherapy sessions. Now, if we think about dispelling popular misconceptions, you'll recall the third attitude explained within our hypnotic mindset pertains to you appraising hypnosis in a way that assures you of its safety and in a way that is free from popular misconceptions. I thought I'd explain and dispel some popular misconceptions so that you feel equipped in that regard and that you are fully educated. Some of the following research findings clash with popular misconception, pop psychology, new age therapy and much of the stage hypnosis hype. Firstly, the ability to experience hypnotic phenomena does not indicate gullibility or weakness. This is a common misconception. Secondly, hypnosis is not a sleep-like state. Many people think hypnosis is similar to being asleep when it is nothing of the sort. As you have heard already, hypnosis requires you to be engaged and focused. Hypnosis is also not the same as relaxation. Banyer writes about and builds upon her earlier work from the 1970s with Ernest Hilgard, whereby she showed that by having a client exercise vigorously for a period of time prior to a hypnosis session, the client could still be hypnotized but would not be at all relaxed. In fact, they would be alert and focused and have a heart rate and pulse that was very active. A client undergoing relaxation training in any form of psychotherapy would not gain the benefits of the relaxation in the same way, making the two quite different. Thirdly, hypnosis depends more on the efforts and abilities of the subject than on the skill of the hypnotist, and this was shown by Hilgard in the 1960s. This is incredibly good news for anybody that's interested in being a self-hypnotist but also in any hetero-hypnosis session too. 
We are in control of our own hypnotic experiences with or without a hypnotist present. Fourth, subjects retain the ability to control their behaviour during hypnosis, to refuse to respond to suggestions and even oppose suggestions. Lynn, Rue and Weeks showed this in 1990. We are ultimately in control of how suggestions affect and influence us. My fifth point, spontaneous amnesia is relatively rare. Simon and Salzburg showed this in 1985. Regardless of the impression TV shows and films can give, it's a common misconception that people forget what happened in hypnosis sessions. The unwanted occurrence of amnesia can easily be prevented by telling yourself or by the hypnotist telling the client that they'll be able to remember everything that is relevant from the session. It's worth bearing in mind also that you don't remember every single second of every single day. If I asked you to repeat back everything you've heard in this presentation so far, you may struggle to repeat it all exactly as you've heard it, but you've not had amnesia about it. Hypnosis sessions are no different. Sixth point. Most hypnotised subjects do not describe their experience as trance, but as focused attention on suggested events. McConkie showed this in 1986. I think I've covered this in detail already within this explanation of hypnosis, but this is more evidence to support this explanation of this subject matter. Seventh point. Hypnotizability can be substantially modified. Gorosini and Spanos in 1986 and furthering that work in 1991 by Spanos showed that many people initially measured as being low on a scale of hypnotic responsiveness can have that responsiveness increased. A good hypnosis professional will show you how to focus on hypnotic skills designed to improve your responsiveness. The key point here is to explain that Hypnotizability and responsiveness to hypnosis are not set in stone for everyone. They can be developed as with any skill. I'll give you a quote from James Braid in 1853. I beg farther to my remark if my theory and pretensions as to the nature, cause and extent of the phenomena of nervous sleep, hypnotism, have none of the fascinations of the transcendental to captivate the lovers of the marvellous, the credulous and enthusiastic, which the pretensions and alleged occult agency of the mesmerists have. Still, I hope my views will be the less acceptable to honest and sober-minded men, because they are all level to our comprehension and reconcilable with well-known physiological and psychological principles. I love that. This clip has been a really basic introduction explaining what hypnosis is. Now this explanation of hypnosis has really good solid replicated evidence to support it and is a far cry as I've said before to the magical mystical and special state type explanations of what hypnosis is. We reject the idea that hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness or a hypnotic trance for example and that in fact it's based upon ordinary psychological factors that we experience a lot of the time anyway. Attitudes, expectations and manner and approach, motivation to be hypnotised for example. I hope that you found this to be useful and informative. If you'd like further information or if you'd like to send me on any questions with regards to this, please do so from my website www.adam-eason.com. That's just Adam Eason with a hyphen in the middle dot com. Alternatively, you can go read my book, The Science of Self-Hypnosis, uh, the evidence-based way to hypnotize yourself, which has a much deeper and further advanced explanation of these points that I've made in this presentation. Thank you for listening. Goodbye for now.